this uh, forum on. Um, so Bridget did mention that my name is Renard Carlos. I am uh, first and foremost, I'm uh, very excited. I am on staff with the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation. I am our program and communication manager with the foundation. A little bit about the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation. We are a community foundation. Our goal is to strengthen communities through philanthropy. So we do that. Obviously, there are a couple of ways that we do that. One, it's through the managing of funds. Then we're able to make grants to communities, uh, nonprofits. Other way we also do that and make those communities stronger is through our scholarship program as well. We're always looking for new partners. And you know, certainly if you're interested in creating a fund with us or you're got some questions regarding scholarships, please make sure I think we have our contact information will be in the chat. Please certainly reach out to me. Love to talk to you a little bit more about what the foundation does. Um, very excited to be here this morning, certainly. Um, our nonprofit, Northern Piedmont Community Foundation, loves to partner with other nonprofits. So we've been, you know, very much engaged with the Mental Health Association of Fauquier County through our grant funding. And we're very excited to be part of this conversation with you. Bridget is going to kind of move us through some of the slides um, that we're discussing here, but BIPOC mental health community conversation. And the objective really of this conversation is to we'll look at facts and figures a little bit we'll talk a little bit about racial trauma mental health uh pandemic impact and health uh inequity then we'll address address grief and community care culturally responsive care and protective factors and each of the panelists will be able to kind of share their background and why we're here and really the main objective is to to get a little bit more of an understanding of the topics, um, find ways to go ahead and move us forward through that. I will remind you, um, if you can, make sure you mute your mics. Oh, I thought um, that way we don't get any feedback. Bridget, you might have to go ahead and mute everyone's uh, mic, yeah. and then I'll unmute my mic once you've muted everyone's mic. Um, with no further ado, let's go ahead and move into facts and figures, uh, Bridget. So a little bit of on the facts and figures. And one of the things I think that we really should be mindful, at least from my own perspective, is the main objective, at least one of them, is to figure out how do we increase awareness and how do we increase involvement in mental health? I'm, I'll speak for myself, my own you know, background here as an African-American um, male. How do we do this? One of the things that I've noticed within my own community um, and from my own life experience is the emphasis on generational understanding, right? So within some of the family units, whereas, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago, well, and I think some of the other presenters will talk a little bit more about it, but you will see, obviously, our country experienced a very traumatic uh, time of segregation and racism and where things were a lot different than they are now. However, those experiences are real and were real. And you have folks in the, for myself, my own opinion, within the African-American uh, family units who have experienced that. And so within some of the family units, if you have a perhaps a grandmother or a grandfather who is very prominent in the family and experienced those uh, traumas, those traumas can then be passed on to their children. And then their children who may have all, may have not had a firsthand experience, but maybe has, have not had a different experience in that, then passes that on to their children. And sometimes the cycle can continue to repeat itself. The same way that certain traumas can be passed down from one person to another one, also um, access and thinking about different ways to maybe um, address those traumas Either they are presented or they're not presented. So let's go through some of the facts and figures here. Um, go back for it. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we've got a little bit of facts. I'm not going to read all of these slides. I think Bridget will probably make it available to you. But there are a couple of things certainly that we'll point out here. Uh, we you can see that uh, depressions are lower and uh, African Americans 24.6 percent and Hispanic Americans 19.6 percent than in uh, Caucasian Americans. 34.7% depression in African Americans and Hispanics is likely to be more uh, persistent. People who identify as being in between two or more races, 24.9%, are most likely to report a mental illness, 
within the past year than any other race slash ethnic group. Native and Indigenous Americans report higher rates of PTSD and alcohol depression than any other race slash ethnic group. Mental health conditions are common among people in criminal justice systems in which BIPOC are overrepresented. 50 to 75% of youth in the juvenile system meet the uh, diagnostic criteria for mental illness. Uh, next slide, please. Um, cultural incompetence, uh, kind of a strong term, but cultural incompetence of healthcare providers likely contributes to underdiagnostics and or misdiagnosis of mental illness in BIPOC communities. So really what we're what it's looking at there, and again, we're looking at maybe an issue, but we're also trying to come up with a solution to it, is potentially finding uh, more healthcare providers or bridging that gap right between the BIPOC and the healthcare provider community. So that's an, uh, you know, we'll see certainly issues or challenges, but we'll see these issues and challenges as opportunities, right? So that's what we really wanna focus on. If there's an issue or problem, here's an opportunity to move it forward. So that might be a, an opportunity to move it forward. And certainly an opportunity for, as we're doing today, community dialogue, and then all of us putting on, I like to call it our thinking caps and finding ways that we, can move those things forward. Uh, language differences is another uh, fact that we get here uh, between patients and providers. Stigmas of mental illness among the BIPOC and cultural presentations of symptoms are, so, are excuse me, I don't have my glasses, are some of uh, the many barriers to care that explains these errors in the diagnostic process. So let's pause there real quick. Don't move that yet, Bridget. So I think it's really important though, as we, we had these community conversations that again, so, language differences between patients and providers. And we kind of hinted at that uh, in the previous uh, bullet point there. And then the other one that, that I think we have a really good opportunity to really address here and try and figure out is that stigma of mental illness among BIPOC, right? And so that's kind of what I was talking about in the very beginning of where it's this passed down or potentially learned behavior, right? Uh, this feeling of, well, you know, in my, just in my, my own personal opinion, and my experience has been, you know, suck it up, tie your shoes, put your bootstraps on, and hey, you know, put your head down and push through, right? And so while that is not a, an awful thought process, right, it, it can lend itself to not speaking up or feeling as if you shouldn't speak up or not maybe knowing how to address that um, that mental health issue, that challenge, right? So that culture, that stigma of mental health illness among the BIPOC communities. Um, so that, that'll be something that I think probably all of our presenters will be able to touch on in their own personal experience, but I do think that's important. The other reason that I want to, to kind of stick on that for a second is because if there's a stigma, right, of something, we feel that we're going to be judged or there's a thought process that maybe I'm less of or whatnot. That's a, a, again, as we talked about, an opportunity, right, for all of us as a community to help try and break down some of those barriers and pull down some of those stigmas, right? So that's an, an opportunity for us as a, as a group and as a community to help on that. Okay. Um, and then we talk about cultural presentation of symptoms or some of the many barriers to care that explain these errors and diagnostic process. So cultural presentation of symptoms, that's also important, right? It's important for, and again, a, an opportunity for us to educate ourselves as a community, right? On what are the symptoms of mental health issues? What are you experiencing? If you are, you know, clinically trained, some symptoms are probably going to pop right out to you and, and you can diagnose those things, or you can help folks kind of walk through that, that process. An opportunity, right? An opportunity for us as a community together to talk about what these symptoms are. So if you have friends, neighbors, coworkers, family members who, who start to experience these symptoms and they come to you and say, you know, I don't know, I'm just tired all the time. I'm just, you know, it's not sun shining outside. So I'm just feeling kind of blue. That may be true, but it may also be part of something else, right? And so to be able to have those conversations with them or point them in the right direction is again, an opportunity for us as a community. Okay, Bridget, we can go to the next slide, please. 
Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the very beginning, uh, racial trauma, and I'll read through again, these, this information has been pulled from the Mental Health of America um, by Bridget. People of color and all those who live, whose lives have been marginalized by those in power experience life differently from those whose lives have not been uh, devalued. Um, very quickly, certainly, again, we've talked about um, trauma, right? And we've talked about um, how we move forward from that. But certainly, you know, 40, 50, 30, 40, 20, 10 years ago, eh, maybe 10 to a little, not quite right. But, you know, in that time where we see laws that are created to devalue people of color, black, brown folks, um, then absolutely, right? Speaking up is probably not something that uh, you're as willing to do because you are fearing the negative consequences of doing such, right? So, and then we talked about that that behavior or that mentality um, and the effects of it carrying over from generation to generation, right? So again, opportunities for us as a community, opportunities as, as a group to acknowledge that past trauma and to also be cognizant of the potential to have that trauma live on from generation to generations or some folks not being able to give an opportunity to say, hey, well, there's an, a, an alternate route for you or, hey, things have changed. And so seeing that trauma live on. Overt racism and bigotry lead to mental health burdens that are deeper than what others may face. Um, you know, we all have trauma. No one has lived, I, I believe, no one goes through their lives without experiencing some type of trauma, right? Um, whether it, we're focusing here a little bit on racial trauma here, but trauma is trauma, is trauma, is trauma right? We, we need to identify it correctly and then understand the, the ways to move forward from that and to heal from it. Racism is a mental health issue because racism causes trauma. And trauma patients... Um, and trauma uh, patients are direct line to mental illness. Past trauma is prominently mentioned as a reason that people experience serious mental health conditions today, which comes through as racial trauma. So again, looking at the impacts of you know that racial um, bigotry or things, racial bigotry, and it's just not ra racism alone, but that is part of the equation that we're talking about and the way that that, that transfers and looks at you know, trauma or a lack of wanting to come forward or to talk about um, mental health challenges in our community. So we're going to get ready to move over. And I'm going to pass the mic on to my esteemed colleague and my friend, Darlene Kelly. Um, Darlene will share a little bit more of her background with you. Um, I've known um, Ms. Kelly for quite some time through our work with NAACP together on various other products. So it's uh, a pleasure to be on the panel with her. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Renard. Good morning to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, a lot of what I had prepared to talk about, especially with statistics, have already been presented, but this is who I am. I am a native of Rappahannock County. I was raised in Huntley and um, went to school to be a registered nurse, and my career background has been registered nurse and hospital administrator basically around quality of care and um, risk management. So that has, uh, what, that has been where I've come from with my passion. Uh, I'm a storyteller and I think sharing stories gives a really good um, vision of where someone is. So health equity is my topic today. And I wanna tell you a little bit about why I'm so driven with that. Within my own life and being very personal about Darlene right now, I have had some mental, some mental opportunities with devastating things that have happened in my life. Deaths, um, areas of, of grief that it has taken me to. But when I think about health equity and health equality and that's my passion, I look at my life and I see where I was going into renal failure. And I had all kinds of specialists because of my diagnosis, but not one of my clinicians was looking at my kidneys. So one day I decided to look at my lab work and because I had the medical background, it was quite helpful for me. But during the height of my illness, 
I wasn't even looking at that. My kidneys were in trouble. So I had to refer myself, self-referral to a nephrologist. When I presented myself to the nephrologist, she took one look at me and said, where have you been? And I said, this is the issue. My medical record said for the longest time that I was Caucasian, and, uh, but I'm not. There's some biracial there like it is with all of us. I said, the issue is the lab work. Lab work is already uh, separated out from whether you're black or white. So it already has the parameters there that black people are going to have higher abnormal lab values when it comes to looking at your kidneys. So what happens is a practitioner will look at that and go, you're in the normal values, but I'm not, and I wasn't. Normal values are for everyone. There's not a black kidney, there's not a white kidney, there's not a Hispanic kidney, but because they label out people of color having higher values, we get put in a zone of, well, you're, you're normal, you're average. And then what happens? A lot of us end up on dialysis and living a life that's not worthy of equity and equality. Not a good thing. And so thank God there's been enough uh, interest in this that some medical uh, associations have turned this over that the lab values are to read the same for everyone. I'm here to tell you that's still not true because they, the lab values still have on their uh, colored people's value and the non-colored people's values. But they have made a little comment in small print that everyone should be on the same spectrum. That's one of my stories. But what has led me to health equity and health equality it's not only looking at kidney issues, uh, it has been looking at cancer among people of color, uh, for men, particularly prosthetic, uh, prostate cancer, which leads to many other uh, illnesses. And so today, I just wanna share health equity and what it really means for everyone. You know, there are core beliefs out there, and these are the ones that I do subscribe to. All human lives have the same value, and every human being has the uh, right to be healthy and to be able to fulfill the potential in their lives. The right to health is not the only right held by our patients or our family members, but it is a fundamental human right. And all people need to stand together. And I've heard um, our moderators say that, that we all need to be made aware, all need to be a part of this. And there is such an injustice in all the ways that we want to frame people. I'm not someone that likes to use terms to identify people. I'm more of looking at people of, of how they interact with each other, how they're how their heart really is and still titling us uh, white, black, Hispanics. But that is a reality of how we're gonna get some things changed. It is all of our moral call, our purpose to take actions to, dis to expose all of these social injustices and work towards correcting the system that is causing the inequities and the equalities. You know, when you think about equities, all of us want to be on the same line to get the same type of care. And when you think about equality, we're not all there. And most of us have seen the image of a baseball game where some people are tall enough to look over the fence. Some of us have to have a, a box that allows us. Some of us have to have three boxes. Some of us need to have four. Well, that's not the area that we want to find ourselves in. So when you think about mental health disparities that we're talking about today among minorities, I wanna make it uh, clear when I'm speaking of minorities that I am talking about Black, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Asians, Pacific or Asian India. 
and all those in between. I, I look at all of us. We all have backgrounds where there is some mixture of whatever uh, racial or ethnic background. So all of us are a part of this. It's not uh, just one characteristics of black versus white, but there are the races that I have pointed out that are having real problems about getting mental health care. Now we did see a slide that talked about why there is such a disparity. And um, some of the things that I am going to share with you are up to date from April 20th to 2022. You know, there, there is poor mental health outcomes due to a lot of multiple factors. Inaccessibility of high quality mental health care services, that cultural stigma that uh, moderator talked about that surrounds mental health care and discrimination. Mental health systems are weighted down heavily towards non-minority values and cultural norms. Provider racism, bias, and discrimination. That's uncomfortable to say, but it is a true factor. Mistrust, mistrust of our healthcare system, lack of and high cost of adequate health insurance, limited access to this quality care, and we heard a good description of language bearers from our moderator. And we have an insufficient number of providers who can speak more than one language. And another key factor here is limited awareness about mental health illness. That stigma has caused a lot of people to be mentally ill for, the, for most of their lives, if not all of their lives. And when you look at someone's faith background, their Christianity especially, uh, that I can speak to, um, it's always wrapped around, where's your faith in God? You don't need to go get help with anyone else. Not true. Mr. Moderator, how much time do I have? Uh, we're gonna get, this is slated to go from 10 to 12, but um, you know, we're, we're wanting to make sure we got time for, so we got two okay. more groups and then we want to add uh, some discussion questions okay. I think you're okay for now well okay raise your hand when you say okay darling let's move on I'll give you the classic number one like that thank you so oh classic is right so the mental health statistics that we heard earlier with that slide was talking about depression which depression can lead you into so many other problems but I want to share a little bit about Black African American community. The, the number and percentage of mental health illness in that group is 17%. And that represents 6.8 million people. With the Latinos and Hispanics, that mental health uh, statistic is 15%, representing 8.9 million people. So I've, I've, I'm speaking to you about this from the highest to the lowest. Asian American and Pacific Islanders, uh, they're looking at 13% of mental illness with 2.2 million people. And the native uh, community, 23% of them have mental illness, but the population is only 800 and 830,000 that are affected by this. So when we mix all of us together and we're looking at multiracials, whether you have uh, Caucasian, Black, Indian, Asia, Latina background, all mixed together, we're looking at more of these races have mental illnesses combined, which is a 25%. That's high, that's a lot of people. So we need to be aware that we are that village that everyone talks about. There is one body with many parts and the ones that have less availability of care are gonna be the ones that are not being reached and they cannot have what everyone is entitled to. That all of us should have the opportunity for that equitable health care so that we can live the best life possible. So I'm excited that we're here today talking about that so that we can all become involved. So when I was listening to our moderator, 
and we're sharing why we have the passion to be here today and who we are and how all of our stories have brought us here. It has made me see that community awareness and uh, organization, whether it's for-profit or non-profit awareness has been heightened because everyone's talking about equity. We're talking about equality. Today, we're putting health in front of that. And in front of health, we're putting mental. So everyone has an awareness that has been raised to a level of motivating us to wanna do something. But what I want to encourage all of us to do is not just to put a, a check in the box because this is reality. I'm living it, you're living it, people we know that are living it. And COVID-19 has really moved us into the reality of mental health. COVID has isolated us. It has changed how we socialize. It has brought to the front depression. It has brought to the front of people remembering the things that have been very traumatic for them. And I have been isolated since March of 2020, a um, long time. And this is a reality for me. And it is because of my immune uh, system. And the reality that even the vaccines will only bring me probably to about a 45% of coverage and protection from COVID. So when I think of my own isolation and my own mental health, I've had to do some things to make a difference. Um, I, I've started a vegetable garden and a flower garden. I set up Zoom programs with my family, especially my grandchildren so that we could meet regularly. And that list goes on, but that's Darlene. That is Darlene because I have a background that supports that. I'm educated, I've had exposure, and I am in touch with my own mental health issues. One of the mental health issues that brought me more compassion and empathy is I had an eight-year-old son that was murdered in a car wreck by a drunk driver who was, uh, drunk and intoxicated with alcohol and um, drugs. So I have some tools that I've had to use for many years that have allowed me to be able to withstand and to still live mentally healthy with this COVID-19. But there have been opportunities for me because it's overwhelming. So when we think of our brothers and our sisters who have no exposure for, for self-care. And I have a good friend in mental health that every time we have a meeting, she's encouraging us to uh, take care of yourself, go out and get some fresh air, do this and do that. These people who have depression that we've talked about in the beginning, the depression for them can be and have been even more overwhelming with COVID-19 and they have no way of getting out of that box. And depression brings about other health problems, hypertension, diabetes, heart issues, cancer. And so health equities are all around all the healthcare issues. So when we think of mental health, we're thinking about everything that surrounds mental health. Mental health means that you have to have a safe place to live. You have to have food. You have to have clothing. You have to have access to care. You have to have a community that surrounds you that is looking at community problems when it comes to health equity and mental health equity. We're quite fortunate in our counties to have a mental health association that is very progressive. But what is becoming more and more uh, important is that we bring in other groups, just like today, to have a conversation. Conversation brings that awareness level up. I think that's, I think that's that's perfect. Uh, it's actually the perfect segue. I don't know if you planned it like that or not, but it's the perfect segue for it, um, Darlene. I um, we're gonna get ready. If it's okay with you, we get ready to move it over 
to uh, Miss Bernice, who's going to get ready to go for her next point here. But I want to want to focus on something that you said that I think is incredibly important because we're focusing on a specific group, right? So we're talking about a specific group and you pointed that out and there are specific challenges, right? And that are unique to the groups that we're talking about. But the solution, the solution is gonna be all of us coming together. And you rightfully pointed that out and said, hey, but this is about a community solution. The, the challenges are unique, but the solutions have to be all of us coming together to address it. So I, it's perfect. So I wanna thank you so much for your comments on that. And then uh, this time we're gonna get ready to turn it over. Uh, to, uh, to Bernice. Moderator, as yes, we come to a close, I do have something that I do wanna announce because sure. there is a community involvement. Sure. And so thank you for this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to hearing what the other panelists have to say. Yes, ma'am. And at this time we'll go ahead and turn it over to uh, Ms. Uh, Bernice Fields. Good morning. <laughs> I'm Bernice Felder, and I'm going to be talking about grief work, I'm sorry, grief and the impact of the pandemic on BIPOC communities. Um, a little bit about me. I have my own business. It's called BLF Services. Um, I have private clients, but most of the work that I do is with Falkir, Rappahannock, and Prince William County Departments of Social Services. Um, I work with the juvenile court system, and I work extensively with the Fauquier County Public Schools. The work that I generally do with them is a parent mentor, um, supervised therapeutic visitation. My background is in, um, I have a human services counseling degree in crisis response and trauma. Um, I'm a nurturing parenting program facilitator. That is an evidence-based program um, to help families um, work more effectively. Um, I have been married for almost 33 years and I have seven children. Um, so I'm bringing a lot into play. Um, so when we're talking about grief, and grief work is work that I do on a volunteer basis. When we're talking about grief, I'm gonna, we're going to define some things. We're going to talk about types of grief. We're going to talk about um, how, how um, grief impact these specific communities differently um, and, and ways that we can use interventions and find ways to help these communities. So grief. Doing my talk, grief and loss is going to be used, those words are going to be used interchangeably. Often, grief is going to be used interchangeably with trauma um, because they really are all the same thing. Grief brings about trauma, trauma brings about grief. So they work hand in hand. So grief is common to man and it, it touches every human being. Um, and it occurs on many levels. It occur occurs on the physical level, the cognitive level, the emotional level, and the spiritual level, and psychologically. Um, grief is defined as a set of thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and physical sensations that can cause us great despair. Grief is what we feel. Mourning is what we do. Um, one author wrote that, like a silent conspiracy, we seem to have an unspoken agreement with others not to talk about our losses. Um, grief can be overwhelming. Grief brings about enormous practical disruptions in our lives. Um, it, it is a sense that nothing is right, our world is turned upside down, and the order and predictability in our world has been shattered. It is the feeling of loss at an interrupted or broken connection. So we have a lot of thoughts about grief. Some are spoken, some are not. So for many people, you know, they think, well, grief is being sad. Um, or they think we should, and we can only grieve certain types of losses, um, like the death of a loved one. Or they'll think things like, oh, no, you know, she should have been over that. Her husband, her spouse, her child has been dead 10 years. You got to move on. You got to let go. You got to live your life. Um, and, and one of the biggest thoughts that people have is grief moves in a certain pattern. 
we often associate um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five stages of dying as the stages of grief. But let's be very clear, those are stages of dying, not stages of processing and living through grief. Um, so when we look at the pandemic's impact on grief, um, the pandemic resulted in isolation for all communities. Uh, many losses could not be traditionally grieved. You know, losses that society would normally deem as successful, uh, I'm sorry, as acceptable, the loss of a loved one. That's an acceptable grief. But during the pandemic, that could not be grieved traditionally. We couldn't have funerals. Um, we couldn't have, you know, wakes. We couldn't have um, get togethers. And so the isolation impacted everybody. When we look at that and how it impacts grief, um, this resulted in what we call disenfranchised or unrecognized losses. So when we look at disenfranchised grief, it is defined as the pain of a significant loss that is not openly acknowledged. However, during the pandemic, we had many other types of losses. We lost family members to COVID. We lost family members to suicide. We lost family members to addiction. We lost family members to accidents. The loss of socialization, you know, uh, the media is, is, is rampant with reports on how the loss of social, socialization impacted our children. Their learning processes, you know, supposedly our children are at least a year, two years behind because they didn't have that, that, that you know, gathering to learn. Um, for many, there were loss of, tra of traditions. Weddings were not held. Baby showers were not held. Um, birthday celebrations were not held. The holidays were not a time of family gathering and support. So when we look at the, 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 the role that the pandemic has played on our lives, it has been significant and it, it has impacted every area of our lives. So when we talk about that impact within um, the BIPOC communities, those losses, and the inability um, to process those losses through normal means exacerbated um, the issue. For many of our communities, you know, they're, they're immigrants. So when you, when you put on top of the losses from immigration, losses of their country, losses of their native language, losses of their family, losses of traditions, losses of relationships, connectivity, um, losses of their presumptive world, everything they knew. And so when they come to America, it all changes. But generally, they would have been able to connect. They would have been able to, to be with each other, to have a commonality. COVID impacted that. Um, Darlene had talked about the spiritual role uh, or, or the role that spirituality and religion plays in our life. All of us lost that, but in, in, in communities of color, um, spirituality and religion is sacred. It is held in high esteem. So being unable to worship together were created significant issues with grief and isolation. The loss of finances, the loss of jobs, the loss of security. When you look at all of these losses that all of us experience, but particularly in the BIPOC communities, the problem was, magna was multiplied. Um, so uh, Renard and the slides had talked about historical grief. And, and, and you know, when we're talking about the role of race, when we're talking about the role of, of slavery, when we're talking about marginalism of, of co uh, communities of couple, uh, I'm sorry, communities of color, um, it has been particularly hard because those things did not go away. Those, those, those thoughts, those feelings, those barriers did not go away. They kind of just went hiding. Now that things are opening, they're showing themselves a little bit more. And so Renard had also spoke about generational grief. The grief that we bring, the stories of our families, 
that just kind of exist. They're not talked about. Because remember, grief brings about significant pain and no one wants to deal with pain. So we kind of shy it away, thinking that if we don't deal with it, if we don't see it, it'll go away and we'll be okay. Grandma was okay, she dealt with it. Um, it, it doesn't work that way. If you don't deal with grief, grief will deal with you. So when we, when we look at that, when we look at the shame, the guilt, the anger, that historical grief and generational grief brings into our lives, we also have to have full awareness that this is happening. When we're talking about mental health, thing to me during, during my coast coursework that um, one of the early pioneers in psychiatry um, diagnosed a disease called drapetomania, which was the belief that it, it, was, it was described as the mental illness that impacts slaves who try to run away because slavery was so pleasant that you had to be crazy to want to get away from the lifestyle. So when we have a system um, that had that idea and that idea perpetu perpetuated for years, um, we have to be careful as professionals that we are not culturally encapsulated. When we're talking about grief, when we're talking about mental illness, I believe in the work that I've done, many diagnoses of mental illness is really just grief. Some of the manifestations of grief are anger, anxiety, numbness, a sense of helplessness, headaches, a feeling of emptiness, loss of appetite, exhaustion, insomnia, crying, avoidance, withdrawal, moodiness, changing relationships, hyperactivity, um, a, a loss of, of, of spiritual connectivity. However, if you look at these symptoms alone, and if you haven't done some work to understand the role that grief plays in our lives, um, they present as mental illness. Um, and so we have a lot of, of people, in my opinion, who have been diagnosed with depression, <laughs> and anxiety, um, sorry about that, depression and anxiety, um, and maybe even bipolar disorders or, or general uh, generalized anxiety disorders that actually are just sad and they need to do the process of grief. Um, there are many interventions that we can use as professionals to help people. But first, what we have to do is make sure we understand, we learn a little bit more about grief and that we give ourselves permission to deal with our own grief, to do the work. It's hard work. It is hard work to feel those feelings and not feel as if you're dying. It's hard work to cry about the loss of something, be it a dream, a goal, a loved one, um, a child, um, a job, it is hard to grieve those losses with, without, and, and thinking, okay, I'm gonna cry about it without thinking I'm gonna cry for the rest of my life. There are ways, there are interventions that we can deal with grief. One is for the professional to get a better understanding of grief, to set aside judgment, to set aside what they think um, mental illness looks like on, 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 a, on a, a generalized spectrum and to understand that different communities express grief in different ways. An angry person may not have a problem with anger. They may be sad, it presents as anger. It presents as um, depression. So suspend judgment, listen to what people are saying, familiarize yourself with the cultures. I'm not talking about taking a deep dive in, 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 into the culture of, of Chamorros, those from Guam. I'm talking about just a cursory look at their, their, their culture and what they think about death 
um, assess their loss. If you're talking to someone and they say, you know, oh yeah, you know, because often what I found that as when I begin to work with clients, what they present is actually not the problem. It is something deeper. It is something else. And if you listen, you will hear, you know, 10 years ago, um, I suffered a miscarriage. Five years ago, my husband left me. I lost my job. Um, my family turned on me. All of these are losses that are bringing them to a point um, where they are presenting in ways that you may have to dig a little deeper for. And we have to be intentional, intentional in how we deal with people in the mental health community, not assuming anything. Um, Miss Bernice, oh, I, I do have to get ready to, to move us on. I'm sorry, thank you. No, 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 no not a problem at all. I've got to get ready to move us to the next uh, speaker. What, I, at the very beginning when we talked about, uh, we were talking with the Mental Health Association about our time frame, and they said, well, you know, it generally doesn't, it lasts by our, hey, I think we could take this thing till five o'clock. I mean, it's so impactful with the, the speakers and what you said. I really like, as you pointed out, the impacts of grief and the reality that you have to deal with. And I like what you said as well. If you do not deal with grief, it will deal with you. And so, you know, I wrote down my notes here that we are all, again, the objective here is to look at this as we are all mental health advocates, right? And while, again, we are discussing a specific area we're equipping ourselves with the tools to be able to address that. So that's been fantastic. Thank you, Bernice. I'm going to get ready to, uh, to pass it on now to uh, Ms. Tini. Uh, if I mispronounce your name, I apologize. Uh, and it's uh, which work to kind of bring us on home and talk about the next kind of uh, subject here at Matter for us. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. You pronounce it correctly. <laughs> I am Teeny Wordsworth, like Renard said, and I am the owner and president of Reemerge Child Therapy. Our focus is primarily on school-age children and um, parental relationships. So a lot of the um, children that come into my practice has behavioral, social, and mental issues. But since this is a more general topic, I wanna to just talk briefly about what Renard and Darlene and Bernice has already talked about, about how people of color and those who are living lives have been marginalized by those in power experience mental health just a little bit differently and how racism, I know Renard had said in the beginning, how racism is a mental health issue because racism causes trauma. And I think a lot of times we forget that, that racism does cause trauma and how that can impact our experiences, like I said earlier. And I think the interesting thing, a lot of times this is really subtle the experiences that people of color have, it could be maybe someone avoiding coming into the neighborhood because that's where people of color live due to their own ignorance and fear. It could be banks and companies not really giving you any type of loan because of your color. It could be mass incarceration of your peers. It could be school curriculum not really being being ignored or minimized in contributing to our shared history. So there's so many ways that people of color uh, are impacted by racism. And of course, as we're aware, there are systemic racism, there are many different types of racism, but how does that relate then to mental health? The way it comes down a lot of times is we see that there's a lot of mixed diagnosis for African-American and um, Black American clients specifically, because they tend to overemphasize the relevance of psychotic symptoms and overlook symptoms of major depression. And so when they are in front of a clinician, the lens that a lot of times that the clinician is viewing the client through tend to, like I said, uh, result in a lot of misdiagnosis. And I know Darlene mentioned that briefly as well. And so as a result, four times more african People of color are four times more likely to be diagnosed with six, schiz, I'm sorry, schiz, I'm a little nervous, <laughs> with schiz, schizophrenia than their, um, their counterparts, um, specifically white males and black male counterparts. Additionally, we find that biop youth um, with behavioral and mental conditions tend to be more likely directed to the juvenile justice system than to any type of specialized care. 
and also that also the non-Latin um, counterparts as well. And so you could see that how people of color are handled on the institutional level is quite different. And so I'll give you a, a quick, some more quick stats. And so adult rates of mental illness in some bio population are sometimes comparable and slightly lower than the rates in white population. Um, we often experience a disproportionately high burden of disability for mental health illness. And black adults are 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than their adult white counterparts. And so in my practice, I do have interns and I have um, newer clinicians. And so the question that I usually ask myself is knowing the statistics and knowing the cultural impact and knowing how racism provides traumatic experience, when you have a client present to you, how do you do an assessment that takes into account all of these things? Or just not even on a racial level, racial level, but social, cultural, right? So it doesn't really matter who shows up in front of you. How do you keep in mind when you are assessing a client that you are keeping that you're assessing them in a way that you're aware of your own cultural biases, you're aware of your own societal influences, you're aware of, you, you are aware of that. And I find that a lot of clinicians are not, which I think ends up harming their clients. And so, cause I feel like Darlene's situation could have been avoided easily, right? With um, almost going to renal failure, had the clinician maybe been a, a whole lot more objective and not so sub subjective when they were conducting their assessment. And so when I'm training clinicians, every single part of our assessment, we make sure that we, we are looking for any type of diversity component that we need to implement into our assessment. So for example, if there is a, um, and, and it varies. So, because like I said, I. Uh, predominantly work with children. So if this is a client that might have a learning disability, right? If I do an assessment and I don't take into account the learning disability and I am here having an intervention with a child that doesn't really understand or I have not taken that in co into consideration, the level of care really will not be, right? It will not be helpful. So am I trying to help me or am I trying to help the client at this point? And I think a lot of times it's so much harder for you to take that, that little step, right? Because for me, I feel it's little, but it has such a huge impact for you to be able to really pay attention and see what's in front of you from a lens that take into consideration the person's culture, their history, their, take into consideration them. Do you see them or are you imposing your own biases onto them. And I think sometimes, I think just making that slight difference, even though it's small, can make such a huge impact because yes, we all have our own stuff, right? We all have our own prejudices. We all have our own biases. We all have our own, we're human. But the question is, are you aware of that? And are you able to not impose that on your client when they're in front of you? And I think just, just that small awareness, because I know, I know Renard had said, it doesn't require that we take tons and tons of classes, right? The client is in front of you, you can ask them questions. You could be open, you could be concerned, you could be curious. They will tell you who they are. So I don't need to go take a course to find out who Bernice is. If Bernice is in front of me, if I am showing up with compassion and love versus my own prejudices and my own biases and my own stereotype, I'm not gonna see Bernice. So the question is, how can I see Bernice? How can I open myself in a way that I'm able to see who she is and I'm able to form a plan and form a treatment plan based on who she is, based on, but not based on who I think she is or how, what I feel about her. And I think making those shifts I find is, just, I mean, and I'm a proponent of compassion, right? So even if you don't know, I feel if you interact with someone on a compassionate level, I think even that is healing, even that transcends everything, 
right? And so showing up in a space of compassion, showing up in a space of openness, showing up and truly wanting to see who's in front of you, I really think is a way that we could be culturally responsive in care. And that's all I have, Renard. <laughs> Thank you for that. It was, that's a, a fantastic point to kind of transition for, um, that's just fantastic. I love what you said about looking at our own cult, your own bias, right? We all have biases, right? So it's, it's important for us to kind of make sure that we're taking that into consideration to make sure that we see him or her. I like what you said. How do I see him or her, whomever I'm working right in front of? How do I see them? If I don't address my own biases, if I don't, you know, do the work, as you said, just um, ask some questions. Asking questions can really help you to see that person. I remember my own work. Uh, you know, I ran for elected office, and as soon as it's different from being a candidate, right, and to the guy who now is in the the seat. And so I remember being after I got elected, I was super nervous because then a reporter wanted to call and they wanted to ask me questions like, "Oh, you know, I'm not a candidate anymore." Like what I say now really a little bit more impact. And I never forget what he told me. He said, "Bernard, I'll tell you what." Um, people can always tell the difference between something that you say that has sincerity behind it and something that does not have sincerity behind it. So that what I mean by that is they'll, they can kind of forgive uh, a fumble in your words, or, you know, maybe you got something kind of backwards a little bit if it's sincere and people can see that. And so what, what you're saying on there is like, how do I see him or her? I might be a little nervous to talk about those mental health challenges, or I see some stuff, but if you're sincere, you're asking questions, I think people can see that compassion that you have for them, right? As we all try to equip ourselves to be mental health advocates. So I think what we're gonna do now is, I think Darlene, you had uh, one point that you wanted to mention. And I do wanna open it up very quickly for um, a little bit of Q and A. If you have got some questions and you wanna put that in the chat, I think Bridget's gonna kind of gather those questions together. Um, so let's have, uh, Ms. Kelly, if you want to have your point, we'll look for a couple of Q&A questions. And if uh, we'll move on from there, and we may just give you a little bit more time back in your day to do some uh, mental health, uh, you know, uh, activities for yourself. So let's go ahead and turn it back over to Ms. Kelly at this point. Thank you, Renard. Um, you know, I'm coming to the table today with health equity in its totality. And um, definitely I support mental health um, care. But and all that's been presented today, I want to let you know where we go from here. So there is a group called HEAT, and it is Health Equity Action Team. And Kathy Mar uh, Marmot uh, and I are co-founders of this group. And we've been um, actively working with this group now for about a year and a half. And um, Kathy is a retired attorney, and like myself, she's an educator and a coordinator of projects. But we looked at Falkir County and we saw that, that there's an imbalance here. Um, and a lot of times people look at Falkir County and they see a rich county. And because they see a rich county, they don't see areas where there are minorities not getting health care for all the reasons that I talked about earlier. But the mission of this HEAT group is to provide opportunities for equitable health care and to live the healthiest life possible. And it is to create and support a community-driven health action plan as to ways to lay the groundwork for actions to address health care equity, access to medical care, preventive rehabilitative services for all citizens of Falkir County. Now we started this off with 12 individuals from Falkir County from various backgrounds, professionals, medical clinics, hospitals, and um, Teeny sets on that uh, group with me as well. And so we, we broke it out into an overview of where we wanted to go because we want to develop a community-driven health equity action plan. And the groundwork for all of that is to identify strategies to reduce the health inequities in Fauquier County. So we have four phases. What, the first phase was looking at who do we want to bring to the table? And we had to, to look at the small group, see how many people uh, that the small group is bringing to the tables from their own professional background, their 
for-profit and non-profit organizations. And then we said, okay, so what, what are the health equity problems in Fauquier County? And we all shared what we were seeing from our own background. And then we said, we need an assessment. There are all types of assessments that are being done and you can find those tools throughout any type of Google program. Uh, and you can find what Fauquier County has been doing for years. But our assessment that we wanted to do is based on health equities right here in Fauquier County. We're excited. We are partnering with other groups. And if you have any other questions, uh, I'll drop my number and contact information in there so you can contact me. Um, but health equities, we've got a team here now where we can make a difference in Fauquier County. And it is looking at from all aspects. So I thank you for giving me the opportunity, Renard, to talk about where do we go from here? It's gonna be a real community effort. Thank you. Absolutely, darling. I appreciate that. I, I'd encourage all the presenters to make sure you put your contact information in the chat. Um, should some of our uh, some folks want to kind of reach out to you, I think what we'll do now is um, we're going to spend a few minutes kind of shifting into a question and answer time. And I think Bridget's is going to kind of let some of the questions. I'm going to lead it off here and we'll do that uh, for a few minutes here. And like I say, if we don't give it a whole lot more questions, we'll go ahead and uh, return some of your time back to you. So um, I'm going to ask each of you guys a question. And if you can maybe just go in the order that you presented on. And so the first one that I've got um, for all of our presenters here is, what can we do as a community? Because again, we, we talked about we're all mental health advocates. Um, what are your thoughts on what we can do as a community to strengthen awareness of mental health uh, issues within the BIPOC community? So what are, are so there, there's some, obviously what we're doing now is a start, right? having these community conversations about what about the issue, but moving on from here, kind of as you pointed out, Darlene, are there other ways that we can, again, as mental health partners here, reach out into the BIPOC community to strengthen mental health advocacy? So I'll, I'll open it up for you, Darlene, and then we'll just move down to uh, all of our panelists. Okay, thank you. You've heard me talk about heat. That's a very important one. But the other thing that we're doing within the Mental Health Association organization is that several years ago, I started looking at the faith-based organizations, all faith, not just Baptist, Methodist, but any faith-driven organization. And what are they doing about mental health? What drove me to that is in one of the churches that I belong to, we had an individual who had a problem with drug addiction and she reached out to our leaders in our con con congregation and said, I can't handle this anymore. And what does faith-based organizations do the best? Pray, pray about it, take it back to God. Or that's not our problem. This young lady committed suicide and she killed herself. So from that, we have a group within the Mental Health Association, a committee that is actively pulling together all faith-based organizations were looking at opportunities to be able to bring awareness up, to create education, to create resources. And right now we're working on a, a tool kit that all of the faith-based people that are participating will have information, resources, education, outreach areas that the leaders of these organizations can start looking at mental health in a different way and looking at it where it can make a difference and also looking at it as an individual. Pastors also need to have help and in helping themselves, they'll be helping the congregation. So we're excited about that. Awesome, thanks, uh, Ms. Kelly. Uh, Bernice, same question to you. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the ways that we can do is really just have conversations about mental health. And the construct of mental health, not mental illness. Um, when we talk about mental health, we're talking about living a meaningful life. Everyone has struggles. I think if we could tap into the commonality of all of us having struggles, of all of us hurting, of all of us being sad, instead of us, all of us presenting as our life is perfect, we're good. You know, look at Facebook. Everybody's happy on Facebook unless they're really, really angry. 
I don't have Facebook, but when I look at my daughters, I can tell. Um, so just be real about who we are. And additionally, learn the scriptures, read the Bible. Even if you don't believe, read, and you will see mental health all through it. You will see mental illness, mental problems all through it. That way we can help these communities understand that sometimes you just can't pray it away. It's okay to ask for help. Good. Uh Ms. Wordsworth, same question. I know specifically in the BIPOC community, there's a huge stigma surrounding mental health. And I had one of my um, son's friend was telling me a story yesterday about how one of her, her friend lost her brother and she's been wanting to come to see a mental health professional and the mom has just refused to let her see one. And it's gotten to the point where, because the mom is afraid that if like the family would be exposed, because think about it, right? Historically, African-American family has really been sort of secrecy, right? And we, we were sore to what happens here, stay here type of mentality. And we're not supposed to let others see what's going on in our home. And so I feel that that is still there. That is still very present. And in addition to the stigma for mental health, that, that the need to not bring strangers or to not expose ourselves in that manner really poses a barrier. And I think education, I'm a huge proponent in education, right? Because they're not aware that when you come to therapy, there is confidentiality. I cannot go out and say anything about your family. So because, because they haven't experienced that or they don't have anyone telling them what that's like, it, the, the, her child ended up having to leave the home, right? Like a year or two years later in order for her to seek services. She had to end up applying for Medicaid because mom would not pay for her medical services. So I think education in terms of what happens in therapy, because I don't think a lot of people are aware of what you see is in the movies, right? You come, you lay on the couch. That's not really therapy, right? <laughs> or that could be a form of therapy. That's not how I do therapy. We don't, we don't, I don't, we don't lay on couches. <laughs> We just don't. So I think educating people about what it is and how we can help and maybe even having, there is peer support. So I do know that peer support is extremely effective, right? When you don't feel like you want to go to someone that has, because there is a, po a power differential, let, let's be honest, in terms of the, the therapist and the, the, count, the, um, the, the client. And so sometimes I think a, another way to bridge that gap is having peer support, right? Where they've been trained. These are people who have gone through these experiences. Like for Bernice, it'll probably be grief. Someone who's been through grief has experienced healing and they could sit with their, with their, with their peer in that way. And I do believe Fauquier County is training peer support to be able to help, especially when they are, I know this is something that's been in the works for a little while, when people have to be um, TDO'd, is ten temporarily detained because they're not safe to themselves, that there is a peer support there to sort of help them through that process. So I think just having someone to just guide you through that is really, really helpful. And that is, that's sort of missing right now, unfortunately. And, and maybe even just having a, a hotline where you could call and say, hey, I, I'm a Actually, the Mental Health Association actually provides something similar that if you are looking for services, if you call, they're able to even guide you through that process. So I think there are some things in the community that we're not necessarily tapping in, but just having someone to guide you a lot of times is extremely helpful. I, I think that's fantastic. Um, I've got one question that popped up here, so let me bring this up. Um, we'll do it the exact same way we did it before. We'll start with uh, Ms. Kelly and we'll just work our way down through all the panelists. And this is, what is the best way to decrease judgmental stigmas on mental health in general, and more specifically um, in the BIPOC community? That's a very good question. Um, that stigma 
is so well rounded, rooted. And as Tini just finished saying specific groups where we don't tell our secrets. And the best way to start to approach this is to have conversation like we're having today. And like I've talked about with the faith-based community conversation that we're having, and we must educate about stigma. Let everybody be on the same understanding of the mental health stigma that we're talking about and how it has been perceived and how there are no ways to deal with this until we let it raise its ugly head and that we understand that there are different ways to address your own individual problems, but a, a community approach would be education, awareness, and community conversation. And we move together as a community that cares about one another. Thank you. Uh, Bernie, same question. Um, I agree. I agree with Darlene. I think uh, education and awareness. I think it would be great if maybe we could have some mental health workshops that were less threatening, um, you know, open to the community, um, able to answer questions. In the BIPOC community, again, spirituality plays such a major role in the lives. So when I said learn the scriptures, you know, talk about David, you know, talk about the 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 process that God went through when he grieved the 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 death of his son and how it brings about depression. It brings about times for us to need help. Um, it is okay. You are worthy of feeling better. You are worthy of living a better life. It's okay. Everybody got problems. So I think if we could make it more, um, um, if we could talk about it in easier, less threatening terms, I really think that would help all communities, but especially the BIPOC community. But there's stigma in all communities. So that's Great. It. Great. Uh, Ms. Wordsworth? I agree with what's been said. And I, yes, I think just education, really. And again, I'm going back to compassion, right? Because I truly believe, because I, I know a lot of times we put responsibility on the organizations, but I think a lot of times, I think we, right? Because like I said, I was speaking to one of my son's friends yesterday, right? There are people in our lives that I feel that we have, we're in connection with, that if we see that they're suffering and we see that they're in pain, I think just on an individual level, we could extend some compassion and maybe, like I said, help them lead them through to, to where they need to go. And, and, and I, I don't know, Darlene, the story you told me about what happened in your church really stuck out to me, right? Has she had someone within that community to just let her know that it was okay, right? And there wasn't this level of, I guess fear is the only word I guess that I can come up with at this point, because it really wasn't love, right? So it, it had to have been fear. If she had someone that just told her, it's okay, we love you. Here, let me help take you where you need to go. Despite the stigma that she was surrounded in, I believe that would have made a difference, right? And so it, it, we don't need big, huge organizations. We, we could see our fellow person suffering and, and, and offer to help. And it, it seems so little, but just validating someone where they are is so huge. It's so huge and it makes such a huge difference. And so. No, I think I think you're spot on with it, with validating and seeing folks for where they are. Um, I've got one more question. And if we don't get any more, we'll get ready to give everyone else the portion of their time back for the rest of the day. Um, then uh, the question will be for each of our, our panelists here. When I was um, uh, campaigning a while back, I'll use something that's, that's relevant to me. When I was campaigning, you had to go through the process of getting signatures, right? And you got to get all these signatures to get on the ballot and all these things. And I remember speaking with an older African-American gentleman, and he shared with me um, the past traumas 
that he had experienced that had come at the hands of government. And it had led him to this huge distrust of government and this feeling that um, his voice would not matter, right? And so it was his trauma and his experience was so um, still hurtful to him. And as he talked to me about what they tried to do to his mother, that when I try, I said, you know, you're absolutely right. This is why representation really matters here because it can take your stories and and to legislate in a way that takes some stories and some perspectives that others may not have. And, and you, you work that into the equation. But his trauma was so traumatic that he completely missed what I was saying to him. And his comments were, they're never going to give you a chance, young man. They ain't going to let you on this governing body. And I tried to explain it. I said, well, well actually, I've already won once before. I, I, I currently am an elected official right now. I'm actually your representative. But his trauma was so impactful that he completely missed that uh, whatsoever. So my question for each of the panelists um, is, what do you think? There's, there seems to be two groups, right? When we're talking about the BIPOC community, we're talking about trauma and mental health, right? There is some different generations of trauma. My trauma, uh, being in the BIPOC community, is different than maybe my grandmother's trauma in the BIPOC community. And so I'd like to hear if you all have different thoughts or ideas of how do we reach the different generations of trauma, right, in the BIPOC community? Um, we'll use, again, my maybe my grandmother's generation and my generation. How do you talk to us about trauma and how do we, you know, talk about mental health uh, within those generations in the BIPOC community? We'll start with Ms. Kelly. Thank you. Um, when I have been sitting here actively listening and then just having that question, one of the concerns that I have is that we will not segregate anymore. Um, I know we need to identify where the areas are so that we can have an opportunity to make a difference. I'd like to see us do this collectively and still realize that there are minorities that are having bigger problems. But when you think about reaching people about mental health and all of what you're seeing and Renard, I can identify with that uh, the way my forefathers, my grandparents, my parents did dealt with mental health is that we didn't deal with it. So things continue to get buried down and it took someone finally saying enough is enough. There's something wrong and I need to do something. But if we continue in our boxes and everybody's working on a piece at a time, it's not gonna move the community that we're living in to a, an outreach for everyone that is suffering from mental health uh, issues as well as my, my thing here is health equity and it includes mental health. So we need to, con to move this forward with everybody working together. And everybody has a problem. We've talked about that today. Everybody has their own stigmas, their own biases. So let's continue with conversation. Let's continue with education. I heard something about workshops and I am for those as well. But let's have a real definition of moving forward so that everybody's involved, not just this one group. Because when I think about equity, it's not just based on your skin color or your background. It is also social and economics. So everybody brings different aspects to the table. So let's work collectively, let's bring awareness, let's educate, and then let's come to the table with some real ideas to make a difference. Awesome, thanks, Ms. Kelly. Same question. I think generationally, um, we have to validate their experiences. We have to listen to them without any buts. Yeah, I know that you went through that, but times have changed, things have changed. We have to respect them. You know, we have to respect our, our elders. There is a role for respect, even if we disagree, we have to listen to them. And I think we have to tell our stories, just like Renard, you said, you told, your, you told him, I've already won office. I've already been elected. And if he doesn't hear, if we consistently do that eventually, 
it won't go over his head, you know, to get closer to the top and then it'll get closer to him listening. So we have stories and show that things do work, that times do change, that we've changed. And we have to, um, I agree with Darlene, we have to work together. You know, the division in mental health, the disparities in mental health are there because people brought division and despair, uh, a divisive and disparative mindset. So we have to work together. We have to listen to them. Awesome. And then uh, Ms. Wordsworth, um, same question. We'll get ready to close out with you. I think she did. Uh, she let me know her internet was kind of coming in and out, so she may not be able to uh, respond. Okay. So to all the presenters, uh, certainly I want to thank you for your, your subject knowledge. I mean, I think this has been a, a, a fantastic presentation from all of you. I've learned something. I certainly hope, you know, our, those who are in attendance have learned, you know, a little something. And again, as we've said, we're all mental health advocates, right? And so we're building our toolbox, just like you would work on, you know, it takes a special type of knowledge to work on a car engine and, you know, various different electronics. So it's important to have the right tools to work on, right? The, the, the projects. And so we're all in this thing together and we're trying to understand how we can be most effective in what we're doing as mental health advocates. And so again, to the uh, Falkier Mental Health Association, we certainly want to thank you all for, you know, taking this step and putting this on and, and focusing on mental health in the BIPOC uh, community. Obviously, certainly want to call out um, my colleagues, certainly from the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation. I actually see um, my colleague, uh, Dee Dee McClure, who's our senior program officer, is on. So certainly I want to thank uh, Dee Dee for joining. And our outstanding new intern, Brady, Braden Working, is also on the call today. So certainly want to um, shout those guys out. I believe our executive director, she's actually in another meeting uh, this morning. And then I do see one of our, our board members on as well. Um, so thank you, sir, for your joining, uh, Larry. Um, I think that just about wraps everything up as far as uh, on my end. Um, again, I would encourage you, if you have any questions, continue to reach out to these outstanding uh, presenters. And I think the main thing is, hey, let's let's keep having the conversation. This is a great start. Let's keep moving it forward, right? Next time it'll be better and bigger and we'll just keep on uh, working on it. Make sure you put your contact information in the chat. And with that, Bridget, I'll go ahead and turn everything back over to you. And certainly thank you for the opportunity to join you. Uh, and to moderate your discussion today. Awesome, thank you so much, Renard. We're so pleased to have all of you and you guys offered such great information. And I think this is, like you said, this conversation will move a lot of things forward. I just wanted to reiterate what I put in the chat. Uh, the Mental Health, Pro Mental Health Association does provide workshops and training on any mental health topic to any community organization. Um, just give us a call. We do workshops on anxiety, um, depression, um, we do these um, kind of webinars like once a month um, and uh, we can encourage, you know, more participation uh, and involvement. We also do mental health first aid training um, for the community and that's one way to um, help reduce the stigma. Um, and I don't, yes. Bridget, I need to add very quickly, I would be remiss certainly to make sure that I, I also shared with everybody. Um, so the reason that I am here, uh, obviously, is part of the work that I get to do with the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation as our program and communication manager. So not sure all of who is on the call, but as a community foundation, our goal is to strengthen communities through philanthropy. Part of what we're doing, we're closing out one of our grant cycles now. So if you are on the call and you are a nonprofit, what we do is how we strengthen the community is through grant making, right? So you say, hey, I'm XYZ, uh, this is what I do as a uh, nonprofit. You do need to be in the geographical footprints of Falkir, Rappahannock, Madison, or Culpeper. That's our service region. If you find yourself to be a nonprofit at 501c3 in that service region, then we love to talk with you. We, um, I'm certainly available. Our senior program officer, Dee Dee McClure, or even our executive director, Jane Bowen Wilson, certainly would be happy to talk with you about um, the work that we do to sponsor nonprofits. Uh, Didi just jumped in uh, there right now, but certainly the, the, that's how we do our work. Uh, Didi, would you like to add a few words on kind of what we do as the Northern Piedmont Community Foundation? 
No, I think you've actually done really well. <laughs> and it is through grant making that we can help uh, community activities and certainly like the one we're talking about today. Um, you can find information about each of our grant cycles on our website, which is npcf.org. I'll put it in the chat. Uh, if you go to our grants area, then you'll learn about each of our cycles and what the possibilities are. But thank awesome. you, Renard. This has been a terrific morning. Awesome. Thanks, Didi. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to uh, you, Bridget. Thanks so much. I think that's it. I think I just wanted to thank everybody once again and um, wish everyone a wonderful day. And remember to take time out for yourself and uh, take care of yourself as well. Thank you all. <laughs>